Um, we're going to, here we go, I have no disclosures. Um, let's start off with a case, 34-year-old diabetic, uh, female on lisinopril, witnessed PEA arrest, who is resuscitated. She has progressive volume overload, approximately 15 liters, oliguric, she's diuretic resistant. This is very similar to the case that I just came from the hospital. Progressive volume overload, I said that, she's oliguric, blood pressure is 100 over 60, requiring pressors. She's mechanically ventilated and sedated, sodium is 129, potassium 5.7, CO2 is low, BN is high, creatinine is high. Um, I get these calls all the time. Um, the question is, what's the best renal replacement modality in this particular case? Watchful waiting, hoping, maybe prayer. So the answer is none of the above, right? Because there is no right answer, okay? You use what you have. If you have hemodialysis, you can make hemodialysis work in this case. If you have, if you're lucky enough to have CVVH or CRRT, maybe that's what you use. Maybe you use SLED, et cetera. So the message is, is that there is no one best renal replacement therapy in this particular case. Many different kinds can be used. So IHD, intermittent hemodialysis, CVVH, which we'll, I'll go through all the terminology as we go through this. CVVHD, which is continuous hemodialysis. CVVHDF, which is hemofiltration and hemodialysis combination, or SLED, which is slow, low efficiency dialysis, or all of the above, and the answer is actually none of the above, okay? So the point is, is that, and the point that I make to my fellows, is that any patient can be dialyzed. It's not necessarily true, but we have to think about it in my hospital, because the default is if the patient's sick, the patient goes on CVVH, and in many cases, that's not the right therapy for that particular patient, and we'll go through what uh, types of conditions benefit from what types of therapy. Okay, so our primary therapeutic goals in acute, acute renal failure or acute kidney injury is to optimize the hemodynamic and volume status. We want to minimize further renal injury. That takes a bit of detective work in terms of trying to identify why the patients have AKI. Correct metabolic abnormalities. The way I explain it to patients is I say we're going we're to balance the acid, balance the salt, try to get rid of some fluid, and also get rid of the toxins. And the, pa the patient's family members tend to understand that. Um, I want to remove some uremic toxins, and then I want to permit adequate nutrition. Limitations of dialysis delivery in acute kidney injury is a hypercatabolic state. Hemodynamic instability makes it hard to remove fluid and control a volume status because patients may be hemodynamically unstable. I also tell my fellows that you know, any patient can, be, uh, can receive hemodialysis. We just have to be really careful about fluid remo removal. And again, that's not necessarily true, but I want to impress on the fellows that hemodialysis can be done in a very gentle fashion in very sick patients. Okay, so the abbreviations that we will throw around. Uh, many of you don't work with continuous renal replacement therapy, so I will say CRRT or CVVH. CVVH is the technique that we use in our hospital a lot, so that may come out of my mouth. I mean continuous renal replacement therapy. So CVVH is essentially continuous hemofiltration, and the veno-venous comes from the fact that it used to be done arterial and venous, and now it's only a single catheter in the vein. The CVVHD is continuous venovenous hemodialysis. So this is essentially doing hemodialysis in slow motion 24 hours a day. And then a combination can be done of the hemofiltration and the hemodialysis, and that is continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration. And we'll talk about what that is and what benefits that may give the patient. We also have SCUF, which is slow continuous ultrafiltration. It's exactly as it sounds. It's slow, it's continuous, but it's only ultrafiltration. So we're not uh, clearing the patient with the exception of water. And then SLED, slow low efficiency dialysis, which many of you may be familiar with. So our primary goals using continuous renal replacement therapy, we want to remove solutes. And that is done via diffusion or convection, and those terms I will define for you. Um, CVVH, CRRT, et cetera, there's a lot of style involved in how we uh, use these particular techniques in patients. I'm trying to give you fact-based things that can actually be asked about on exams, not the way I um, 
will manage particular patients, more of facts that are based. So we'll talk about diffusion, we'll talk about convection, we'll talk about the actual language used, so that if you get asked questions on techniques, you can answer those questions appropriately, even if you don't work with this part particular technique. We also add uh, solutes, so we're adding bicarb um, in our replacement fluid. We're going to fluid remove if we can via convection or even ultrafiltration, and then we detoxify the best we can. In terms of our basic CRT concepts, we're going to talk about convection. We'll talk about what's an ultrafiltration coefficient. We'll talk about a sieving coefficient and solvent drag. Some of these concepts are probably a little bit too high for the boards, but it's important to actually be aware of kind of how these things work. Might help you remember what actually happens with these particular techniques. We'll talk about diffusion in terms of the solvent gradient. We'll talk about what an effluent is, secondary membrane formation, which is uh, what happens over time when blood contacts the filter. We'll talk about what a replacement solution is in CVVH, and then we'll talk about concepts of clearance. Okay, in terms of convection, and a lot of these terms are familiar, but the definitions may not necessarily be crystal clear in your head. So I want to go through these ad nauseum in terms of so you understand the terminology if you're asked about it. So convection is fluid removal and solute removal. It's essentially movement of fluid across a membrane via transmembrane pressure. That's different than dialysis. Transmembrane pressure is external pressure on a particular filter and water flows out. Water moves across this, so this membrane and what happens is, is that the dissolved solutes follow it. And so you have continuous removal of water, continuous removal of solutes. Um, ultrafiltration is something we do with dialysis. That is essentially convection where we're putting pressure on the membrane, removing water. In hemodialysis, the clearance with ultrafiltration is essentially nil. In CVVH, or con continuous renal replacement therapy, clearance with convection is the way we actually clear patients. So hemofiltration involves partial or total replacement of fluid removed, and I'll give you a, a schematic diagram so you can understand what that means in a second. There it is. So we have our transmembrane pressure on our filter, this is our filter cut in half. If you've ever done this with a saw, it's uh, kind of fun to show your fellows. And these are the individual filtration units. This is blood within. With transmembrane pressure or negative pressure, what happens with convection is that water leaves and then solutes follow, everything, okay, with the exception of proteins that are retained because of the membrane size. And so we have all of these things that are leaving the circulation, which when I ask my medical students, is that good to remove everything? They say yes, and I said, really? All you're gonna do is remove everything? And then they realize, no, that's not where I'm going with my question. So the point is, is that what we do with our replacement solution is we replace all of the good stuff, so glucose, sodium chloride, et cetera, et cetera. But we leave out these things, okay? So in terms of ultrafiltration of plasma water, there's this thing called an ultrafiltration coefficient. It's a property of the membrane. And it's the potential to remove water adjusted for the transmembrane pressure. So essentially, how efficient is this membrane at removing water? Solute removal from plasma depends on what's called the sieving coefficient of that particular solute. And that's the ratio between the solute concentration in the ultrafiltrate and its average plasma concentration within the dialyzer. So it's a property of the solute. It's inversely related to solute molecular weight. So you can imagine that small molecular weight solutes come across the membrane easier. And that's a way to kind of remember solute uh, removal and this concept of sieving coefficient. Um, so it's approximately one with small uh, solutes and highly permeable membranes. Different membranes have different permeability characteristics. Um, we tend to use only really one membrane with our CVVH. We don't pick and choose depending on the cases. Okay, so one way to remember convection is continuous renal replacement therapy, or CVVH, starts with the letter C. And this word starts with the letter C. Good. Very good. And so that's one way, one simplistic way to remember the fact that convection, CVVH. When we go to dialysis, we're talking about diffusion. Diffusion starts with a D. I know it's simple, but it helps to, at the very beginning, to think about the differences. And diffusion in and of itself is movements of solutes down a concentration gradient. You're very familiar with this in terms of this is the way dialysis works. It's across a semi-permeable membrane. 
We did experiments when I was in high school in, in terms of these little bags of, of red fluid and we would put these bags in larger bags and see the diffusion. And essentially what we were watching was dialysis. Solutes cross the membrane from the blood to the dialysis fluid compartment via semi-permeable membrane. Dialysis compartment fluid moves in a countercurrent direction from the blood. So what you want to do is maintain the concentration gradient. So constantly you're actually refilling the concentration gradient by pumping blood this way and dialysis that way. Okay? You can't see this on a dialyzer because it has your dialyzer, blood's going through and then you have two prongs where the dialysate is actually pumping this way and the blood is pumping that way. So the idea is to maintain this concentration gradient so you have maximal diffusion. And remember, diffusion is dialysis because they start with the same letter. Diffusive clearance is determined by the molecular weight of the solute. Big solutes, low clearance. Concentration gradient across the membrane, think of a potassium of seven in the blood and zero in the dialysate, which I don't do, but just think of that in terms of that gradient is greater than a gradient between a potassium of seven in the blood and four in the dialysate, which probably is a little bit safer. Maybe that's what you do at the beginning. But that gradient, depend, it, it determines how quickly you can remove uh, the solutes. The membrane surface area. So sometimes we start with very small membranes and then go to medium sized membranes and big membranes when we're initiating patients. So you can see that the clearance over those three therapies will improve in one way because of the membrane surface areas in increased. And then the thickness of the membrane and also the pore size of the membrane will allow more larger solutes uh, if that's what you're, uh, you're after in terms of membrane characteristics. This concept of effluent. So effluent is what basically gets flushed down the toilet, okay? That's the end product of the filtration process. In CVVH, it's the ultrafiltrate. And I'll show you some schematic diagrams of what this looks like. In CVVHD, continuous dialysis, it's the dialysate plus whatever variable ultrafiltrate you're removing, whatever fluid you're removing. In CVVHDF, it's a combination of hemofiltration and hemodialysis. Thus, the actual effluent is dialysate and ultrafiltrate, okay? This is a schematic of CVVH in terms of how it works. So we have, have our access, see this? Yep. Access from the patient. We have a pump that pumps the blood into the actual filter. Um, and then we have the effluent line and then we have a pump so that we can flush this down the toilet or spill it on the floor or what have you. We also have our replacement solution. And the replacement solution replaces what we want. Glucose, magnesium, some potassium, some calcium, etc. And there's two places where you can introduce the actual replacement solution. You can introduce it pre-filter, which is what we do at the, at the Brigham, or you can introduce it post-filter. So, most centers in the United States do pre-filter. A lot of centers in Europe, for whatever reason, do post-filter. And we'll explain what the differences are. And then we have our blood that's returned to the patient. So you'll notice that the replacement solution goes in before it actually hits the filter. So, and the effluent is driven by negative pressure. So negative pressure applied, we remove effluent. So we're actually fairly inefficient. We dilute the blood and then we remove a lot of this replacement solution. But I'll explain why we actually do that and it has to do mostly with trying to decrease clotting in the filter. CVVHD, so this is continuous dialysis. This may be more familiar, access, pump, uh, filter, and blood return. And what we have is we have our effluent or our uh, ultrafiltrate and dialysate and we have our dialysate. Dialysate is pumped this way, blood is pumped this way. Okay? So this is essentially dialysis continuous. The combination is exactly what you would expect. Dialysis, replacement solution. Replacement solution delivered either pre-filter or post-filter. Dialysate deliver delivered countercurrent to the actual filter itself. So blood this way and dialysate that way. The effluent comes out uh, in from a spigot in the top. Okay? So CVVHDF is all it is, it's a combination between hemofiltration and uh, continuous dialysis. So a little bit of technical aspects in terms of the differences between SCUF, CVVH or hemofiltration, continuous hemodialysis and hemodiafiltration. Um, hemodialysis membranes tend to have low permeability. The other membranes tend to be more higher permeable. And so middle molecule clearance is fairly low 
in this membrane. It's not that high in this membrane because usually we're using smaller membranes. But in CVVH and CVVHDF, it's actually quite high. What, does that necessarily matter? I'm not necessarily sure. But is a difference between continuous hemodialysis and continuous hemofiltration in general. And then in terms of replacement fluid, we don't use any with SCUF. All we're doing is slow continuous ultrafiltration. We have replacement solution in hem hemofiltration, so CVVH. There's no replacement solution in hemodialysis, but there is replacement in the combination, okay? And then dialysate, none in SCUF, none in CVVH. It's present in hemodialysis, and it's present in hemodiafiltration. This is a technical thing. It's something that is potentially askable. It's, it's not that difficult if you think about in terms of the replacement solution relative to the dialysate in and of itself. So the replacement solution in and of itself, it replaces the ultrafiltrate that's removed by hemofiltration and hemodiafiltration. In it, it has buffers such as lactate, bicarb, and or citrate. The lactate and citrate are metabolized by the liver and muscle to bicarb. So there are some solutions, which I'll explain later, it's a citrate-only solution, which is essentially uh, metabolized into bicarbonate. Bicarbonate in and of itself is the most easily tolerated, but it can be unstable in solution. So when we mix our Prisma bags and hook them up, I come back about a half an hour later and I show my students that they're full, filled with bubbles. It's essentially the carbon dioxide that's being produced. And so they have to be used fairly quickly. Lactate in and of itself is more stable, but it may contribute to an existing lactic acidosis and it may not be all that great in septic or liver uh, patients. There is a small amount of lactate in the actual um, solution that we use, but it's a, it's a bicarbonate-based solution. And then citrate is what's called regional anticoagulation. So citrate regional anticoagulation, and I mentioned this even though you may not be familiar with it because there's a syndrome that goes along with it, um, which I will present, and it's an easily askable question. It's an easily, uh, it's an easy, relatively easy question that you can get. So citrate causes anticoagulation in the circuit only by chelation of calcium, only in the circuit, okay? And the systemic anticoagulation does not occur. The ionized calcium is restored when blood returning from the actual system is mixed with venous blood. And there's rapid metabolism of citrate to bicarbonate in the liver, and this releases the calcium. So you don't have any coagulation problem within the patient themselves. Patients with severe liver failure cannot metabolize citrate properly, and so they may end up having difficulty metabolizing citrate and develop something called citrate toxicity. This is the citrate replacement solution recipe. You do not need to even look at this unless you're interested in what we use in terms of citrate replacement. I put this in simply because people have asked me multiple times for our recipe, okay? Now, here's our case, number two. 53-year-old male with cryptogenic cirrhosis with septic shock and acute kidney injury on renal replacement therapy. You're not allowed to look at the slide next. I see everybody cheating. Just kidding. So this is our electrolyte profile. So our sodium, uh, our potassium, mm, uh, bicarb, okay, um, uh, BUN 32, creatinine 2.9, glucose of 106. Total calcium is 9.6, and ionized calcium is 0.8. What's our problem? Say again? Somebody said citrate toxicity. Very good. So the ionized calcium is pretty low because usually on CVVH we're giving back potassium. And so did anybody calculate the anion gap? It's 18. Okay, this is a case of a patient with an ionine gap of 18, and maybe that's just because it's at the beginning of renal replacement therapy, they're still sick, et cetera, et cetera. But the clue in this is the fact that the patient had cryptogenic cirrhosis, okay? They're on renal replacement therapy. I didn't tell you what type on purpose, okay? But what's happened is, is that the ionized calcium has dropped and the anion gap has gone up. And so the clue in this is the fact the patient's got cryptogenic cirrhosis, ionized calcium is low, anion gap is high. And this is classic for what uh, you would be termed um, citrate toxicity, okay? In patients who can't handle the citrate, they're going to have an elevated anion gap because citrate is going to be present, and then they're going to drive down their ionized calcium. 
simply because it's actually chelating calcium. Okay? Does that make sense? So this is a way to ask a citrate toxicity question. It's a little bit of a curveball because I didn't tell you what type of renal replacement the patient, patient was on. Okay? So in terms of citrate toxicity, low ionized ca um, calcium, usually we actually replace quite a lot because we see the ionized dropping and we replace, replace. Elevated total serum calcium, why? Because we're replacing it. Uh, we can have an exacerbation of serum acidosis and an elevation of the anion gap. So the solution for citrate toxicity is decrease the amount of citrate that you're giving to the patient or switch replacement solutions to something like bicarb. Okay? Those, are, again, are fairly easily answerable questions. Citrate toxicity is recognized pretty early. Um, I was involved in a case by proxy of a patient that had such low, hypo, such low calcium that they had hypotension and lockjaw to the point where they were occluding their ET tube. And the, the etiology was not citrate toxicity but hypocalcemia. And that was a CVVH prescription that did not include calcium. And so they were bringing off calcium but not repleting it. And this, the calcium dropped to a dangerous levels. So by the next morning, I had replaced the patient's calcium. They were off pressors and extubated. So part of their, a part of their critical illness was hypocalcemia and the sequelae of, all related to CVVH. Okay, so that's, that is citrate toxicity. Relatively straightforward uh, things to see in terms of what happens when you have too much citrate. This sometimes is seen in blood transfusions. It's pretty unusual, but it's an easily askable concept for CVVH. Okay, let's talk briefly about pre versus post dilution. So I alluded to this in terms of pre filter versus post filter. There's two different ways in renal replacement therapy, continuous CVVH, that we can, we can give our replacement solution. So if you think about it, if we dilute the blood out, what we're going to do next is we're going to maximally dehydrate the blood by taking water out. Transmembrane pressure, water leaves, solutes follow. And so what happens is, is that this blood concentration, the actual hematocrit, increases as it travels down the filter. Okay? So if we give replacement solution pre-filter, we can, we can actually dissolve the blood and actually remove more um, uh, ultrafiltration. Okay? So pre-dilution, the only issue is that we have a little bit of less clearance because it's diluted, reduced efficiency by about 10 to 15 percent. But ultrafiltrate is, or ultrafiltration rate itself is not limited because we're diluting the blood. If we give our replacement solution post-filter, the problem is, is that the blood coming down is relatively limited in terms of ultrafiltration, simply because we're going to be increasing the hematocrit, okay? And then we will have blood flow problems potentially. And so that is why most of us will use pre-filter. The problem with pre-filter is we end up dumping a lot of our actual replacement solution down the drain. And the replacement solution is where uh, some of the expense or most of the expense comes from. Okay, so just to review, pre-dilution, replacement fluid is infused at the proximal side, the relatively low viscosity of the blood, the efficiency is somewhat compromised, now it's not terrible, but it's just a little bit less, it reduces net filtration fraction, minimizes concentration of clotting factors, which we like, and we think prolongs filter lifespan, because the blood is diluted. In terms of post-dilution or post-filter, the fluid is given in the distal side, it's more efficient, and it has maximal clearances, maximally dehydrates the blood, which may result in higher viscosity, problems with clotting, et cetera. So you can see the advantages and disadvantages of each technique. I'm telling you about this because you can be asked about it. It's a relatively straightforward concept. It's all where the actual replacement solution is given. Ultrafiltration membranes in general, the hemofilters allow passage of molecules that are less than 50,000 Daltons, which is less than albumin. Small molecules are freely filtered, such as potassium and sodium. Larger uh, substances can be filtered, myoglobin, insulin, interleukins, etc., some medications. But protein-bound molecules or molecules or um, drugs or metabolites of drugs, they are not filtered effectively. So I, when we have a toxicity case, I get asked, can, mole can molecule X or medication X, can it be removed? And I say, well, what's the property of the molecule? Of course, I'm looking up online whether it can be removed. If the molecule is, has a, a low volume of distribution, meaning it's mostly in circulation, and it's small, and it's not bound to protein, I say, yes, we can probably get it. Okay? 
Usually that information is online. It's not always so, and sometimes we get these toxicities where we have to make a judgment, dialysis or not, based on the properties of the molecule. Let's talk about transmembrane pressure a little bit. This is the pressure exerted on a membrane, okay, during operation of CVVH. So it's negative pressure. It's the primary factor that determines filtration rate, so how much is actually being filtered. It's the pressure difference between the blood and, and the fluid compartment in terms of the actual CVVH cartridge. The usual rate is 10 to 500, a fact that you don't need to know. The increased transmembrane pressure is associated with increased ultrafiltration rate. Okay, that's a concept in terms of clearance. That's a technical piece, but it goes with just thinking about it. You create more negative pressure, more water will leave, more solutes follow. Okay? You don't need to know the actual uh, formula there. Clearance is the rate at which solutes are cleared. There's an excretion rate of the solute divided by the blood concentration rate. Formula makes sense. So solute clearance in CVVH t depends on the ultrafiltration rate, which depends on the transmembrane uh, pressure. Clearance in pre-dilution is 10 to 15 percent less than post-dilution. Is clearance in CVVH patients all that important? It's debatable, but probably not. And then pre-dilution mode we talked about, uh, we can increase uh, clearance in this pre-dilution mode by using larger hemofilters, so more surface area, and also a high ultrafiltration rate or a high transmembrane rate. Okay, so we can make up for this not so great clearance, 10 to 15 percent is not that bad, but we can make it up by running the machine harder. So strategies to increase solute clearance, increase transmembrane pressure, increase filter permeability to water, so change the type of filter, increase filter surface area, change the type of filter, or increase blood flow. Simple things, increase transmembrane pressure or increase blood flow as opposed to changing the filter. Or you can do a combination of adding dialysis to your hemofiltration. So if you have CVVH and you need to increase clearance for whatever reason, you can add dialysis and you put them together and you'll have better clearance. Okay, does that make sense? So better clearance with two modalities, hemofiltration, which is convection, and dialysis, which is, somebody said it, diffusion, exactly, because they start with the letter D. So briefly, secondary membrane formation. Essentially, the more you use a filter, the more proteins, et cetera, bind to the filter, the decreased uh, clearance over time for that particular filter. The filters that we use for continuous renal replacement therapy, they have an interesting limit. It's the amount of blood that hits the filter, not the number of hours, but it's the number of hours for the blood flow itself because we develop the secondary membrane and the filter uh, of efficiency drops. So let's talk about some indications for renal replacement therapy. Patients who are at risk for or do have hypotension, severe hemodynamic instability, hepatic failure, CHF, sepsis, multi-organ failure, et cetera, the sickest of the sick. I rotate on an ICU nephrology service and I have to tell my students that we're going to lose patients every day because these are the sickest of the sick. Um, patients potentially at risk for cerebral complications. This is always a conversation I have with my neuro ICU uh, friends. I ask them, do you want me to use CVVH or dialysis on your stroke patient? Well, because they will have different feelings back and forth whether CVVH is better in terms of cerebral perfusion pressure, et cetera. In general, I try to be very careful to not drop the blood pressure. So other indications, increase in metabolic needs, potential massive burns, sepsis, multi-organ dysfunction, volume overload. Occasionally, I will put a patient on a continuous renal replacement therapy only for volume. It's in, and so it's very effective in terms of bringing volume down. We have this, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this concept of pre precise adaptable volume control in a second. Non-renal indications, lactic acidosis, Ongoing production of lactate, you need to replace bicarb. In general, a CVVH machine will give one amp of bicarb, 50 milliequivalents, every two hours. So if you're in the situation where you have somebody who has massive acidosis and you're waiting for your renal replacement therapy to arrive and you give a two amp push, you're giving four hours of CVVH. It's approximately what's delivered. Crush injury, there is a little bit of myoglobin removal. Nothing that's enough 
to actually stop rhabdomyolysis or stop uh, a, a tubular injury, but you can recover it in the ultrafiltrate. Occasionally I'm asked to put someone on just for crush injury and uh, it's not a protective maneuver uh, but it does have some myoglobin removal. Tumor lysis syndrome, occasionally I'm asked to put a patient on CVVH prior to chemotherapy in certain malignancies that have a very high incidence of, uh, of tumor lysis syndrome. Temperature control, there's relative hyper or hypothermia that you can use CVVH on. Why? Because the blood's exposed. And so the actual temperature of the patient drops by half a degree. This is not what to put on patients who are extremely high or extremely low temperature, but you're going to have small changes in temperature. Massive volume overload without acute kidney injury. These are patients who, despite all means, still continue to have increases in volume and there's nothing that can be done put them on CVVH and bring the volume down slowly. And then high NH3 as well. Unusual, but occasional. Potential advantages, increased total solute clearance over time. Gradual clearance may be better tolerated, so it's very slow, the way I describe it to families, is this is like the patient's own kidney, it's slow motion. Everything happens slowly and gently. Even though it's a more intense therapy, it is more gentle. Continuous clearance may help in removal of toxins that have high intracellular concentrations, like lithium. Lithium is everywhere. You dialyze a toxic lithium patient, three hours later he's toxic again. Why? Because it's being liberated into, this, into the circulation from all of the cells. So there's some toxicities that might benefit from it. And then this middle molecule issue, whether increased clearance of middle molecule matters, Something like CVVH can, cl can clean better. Does it matter? We don't necessarily know. But the most important piece is this concept of precise adaptable volume control. The way it works is that for all the ins and all the outs, the nurse or whomever is working on the machine will calculate the balance and then you tell them or I tell them that I want 100 cc's of extra fluid removed per hour. And so what that does is it brings it to zero and then negative 100 every hour. And if I do that reliably and the CVH machine is working and all the calculations are done properly, I can guarantee 2.4 liters of fluid removed per day. Now that might be too much for a patient. So then we say, okay, 50 cc's per hour. And what you get then is you get a liter. 1.2 liter. And people are very happy with that because what it does is it controls all the ins and all the outs regardless of whether the patient gets blood, TPN, what have you. What you have is this beautiful ability to bring patients to euvolemia. We get transfers from outside hospitals where people have been struggling with dialysis and the patient just keeps increasing their size, keeps increasing their volume. Put them on CVVH for a period of time and you get this very gentle removal. And it'll last, you know, it takes a week to get off 15, 15 kilos. And so that's the real, real advantage to CVVH. Potential disadvantages, you might need an anticoagulation depending on what machine you use. There's lack of rapid fluid and solute removal. It is not appropriate for hyperkalemia, uh, uh, life-threatening potassium of 10. It's not going to work fast enough. There's a limited role in overdose setting because it's not fast enough again. It, the concentration gradients are not big enough for us to remove toxins. Um, the relative hypothermia, we talked about that a little bit. Electrolyte depletion if you don't have the proper prescription. And I told you the example of the hypocalcemia uh, of a patient where the prescription was not correct. Technical complications, very similar to, to, to general dialysis. Air embolism, blind disconnection, etc. We do lose blood in our filter and that is a problem going forward. Sometimes I will switch to hemodialysis because we've had a filter go down three times in one day and the patient has lost 600 cc's of blood and that's unacceptable. So we will say, okay, let's do hemo because with our hemo machines, we can anticipate when the filter is going down a lot easier. So other clinical complications, bleeding, thrombosis, uh, nutrient losses is important, um, inadequate blood purification due to downtime and thrombocytopenia. Life-threatening hyperkalemia, don't use CV CVVH, use dialysis. You need to take that potassium down. You can't get it done with CVVH. Now, I just did it over two days in a very sick patient. Just a sec. Sorry. Go away. So life-threatening hyperkalemia is not the way to go. Case three, 35-year-old three year, female, aggressive lymphoma. Burkitt subtype. 
who undergoes cytotoxic chemotherapy. She's going to. Um, total calcium and phosphorus normal. Here's your electrolyte profile. You say, why are you calling me? Right? This is completely normal. Um, the issue is, is oncology is going to ask for CVVH before cytotoxic chemo to prevent tumor lysis syndrome. Oncology asks me how the CRT will alter the chemotherapy clearance. So I look it up and I get this nice black box with no information. And so I say, um, I'm not really sure, but I'm not going to admit that to my oncology friend. Now, I've done this several times, so we've kind of figured out what actually happens and what to do with the chemo. So in terms of this concept of drug doses in CRT, the most important concept of this is if you look up the dose, the dose doesn't give you how strongly you're using your machine. So with CRT, you can do more removal or less removal. It'll just give a CRT dose, which isn't necessarily all that accurate. So there's minimal removal of, again, we talked about protein-bound drugs. If, if you have somebody with digoxin toxicity, this will not work. It will not remove protein-bound drug. Some may be removed via this membrane sticking, right? In the very beginning of sepsis CRT uh, thinking, we thought that we could use a membrane to have all the cytokines stick to it. It didn't necessarily pan out, but the thinking is there. And then drug clearance can be increased with this combo therapy, where you combine dialysis and hypo, uh, um, uh, uh, hemoperfusion. So you combine those, you get bigger clearances. And then higher doses of drugs may be needed if you push your machines harder. I have done up to six liters of replacement solution in a patient with vasoplegia in the cardiac CQ. And I did that because I was desperate. Um, but I knew that a lot of the drug levels were going to drop because I was running the machine maximal in terms of removing everything. So if you have a low ultrafiltration rate, medium or high, so you, low, you run the machine low, medium or high, and I'm being vague on purpose because the numbers don't really matter, the concept is the GFR increases as you run the machine harder. Increase the uh, ultrafiltration, increase the transmembrane pressure, et cetera. So this is an estimate that I found in terms of how to estimate the GFR if you're using something like CVVH. You would look at the replacement solution mLs per hour over the ideal body weight. So 2,000 2, milliliters over 70, approximately 30. And so when my colleagues, my chemotherapy oncology colleagues, ask me, what is the GFR if the patient has none and you're using a machine? And I will say 30. Why? Because I've done this calculation and I've, I've done this several times. And so this is essentially a black box that you can solve. So let's talk about nutrition and CRT. I'm running out of time, but I'll try to be quick. So there's increased azotemia induced by protein or amino acids given with TPN. Fluid overload is, is common with TPN in patients who have acute kidney injury. It's really difficult to manage nutrition if you have acute kidney injury. With CRT, there are negative balances of selenium and copper, thiamine, magnesium, calcium. Usually we replace magnesium and we replace calcium. I gave you an example of when calcium wasn't replaced. But this selenium, copper, and thiamine issue is something if a patient is on for a period of time, they can become uh, quite deficient. This high, high protein diet is safe for acute kidney injury patients who are on CVVH. And we can go up to a protein intake of two and a half grams per kilogram per day. This increases nitrogen balance positivity and corrects amino acid deficiencies. Okay, so the point is with CVVH, you can deliver better nutrition or higher nutrition. And that may actually improve patient's outcome. In terms of sepsis, um, immune modulators are water soluble. You should be able to remove them. They're in this middle molecule category, so maybe CVVH is great for sepsis. But in terms of the experiments done and the studies done, it has not shown to benefit SIRS or sepsis in the absence of acute kidney injury. So there's really no role for CVVH or CRT in sepsis without acute kidney injury, unless you're talking about volume overload or something else, some other non-renal indication. High volume hemofiltration, this is ultrafiltration of more than 35 ml per kg per hour. There's talk of like a sepsis dose of ultrafiltration. This is running the machine really, really hard. In animal studies, maybe it works. In the IVOR study of 106 to 140 patients randomized control trial, there's no evidence that high volume hemofiltration actually benefits patients when compared to a kind of a standard dose. So the idea that more is much, much more is better is probably not true. 
Um, this is a meta-analysis of the same idea, looking at high-volume hemofiltration and acute kidney injury. Four trials, 400 participants. There is insufficient evidence to exist of a therapeutic benefit for routine high-volume hemofiltration in acute kidney injury. So again, more is not necessarily better. In terms of cardiac surgery, the same idea. When we look at early high-volume he high hemofiltration versus conservative CVVH, no difference in outcome in terms of 30-day mortality or other patient-centered outcomes. So it doesn't look like this more is better. It doesn't look like high-volume hemofiltration works. I have used it in certain cases. I have used it in vasoplegia. I have used it in cases where we're having extreme hyperkalemia um, and I've reached my limit. But I know what's going to happen at the end as the patient isn't going to do well. Let's talk about the differences between continuous and hemodialysis. Again, this is an askable piece. If we look at the studies from Visino in 2006, no statistically significant difference in survival when patients in the ICU were managed either with hemodialysis or CVVH. Both methods are complementary. Intermittent hemo, that's faster potassium elimination, important for life-threatening hyperkalemia. Faster drug toxin elimination, this is the preferred methodology for overdoses and better for overdose. CRT, we can maybe give higher calories. We can use in easier and hemodynamically unstable patients, especially removing fluid, and we have this precise adaptable volume control piece. Let me skip, you have all the other information there. Let me skip on to our board questions. In continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration, so CVVHDF, solutes are cleared by the following processes. Ultrafiltration, convection, diffusion, absorption, A, B, and C, or B and C. Drum roll, please. So, A, B, and C. Why? Because CVVH is convection, also known as ultrafiltration. Dialysis is diffusion because it both, they both start with which letter? D, right? You will remember that, I guarantee you. Okay, so diffusion is the dialysis piece. Board question two, advantages of CVVH over hemodialysis. So continuous renal replacement therapy over intermittent hemo. Precise adaptable volume control. I think you've heard me say that seven times. Enhanced middle molecule clearance. I said that four times. Higher filter permeability. Enhanced survival. Higher clearance per unit time. Or A, B, and C. So a lot of people listened. It's A, B, and C. So precise adaptable volume control, that's a big, huge benefit, making patients euvolemic. Enhanced middle molecule clearance may be a benefit, not sure. Higher fil filter permeability, that was a technical piece I told you about. And then enhanced survival, no difference. Higher clearance per unit time, no difference, okay? So it, it's not higher per unit time, meaning dialysis is faster, stronger, and better. You can get a patient from a potassium of seven to not seven pretty quickly with hemo. You can't do that with CVVH. It'll take you two days, okay? Do I have time for questions? One, one quest, one really good question. Really good question. Say again? So replacement fluid dose, if you look at the studies, the early studies said more is better. You look at the follow-up studies, they said more is about the same. So what we do in our institution, we cut our dose from four liters uh, per hour, standard, to two liters, based on the data that more clearance was not necessarily better. Now what we do is we will customize it for the individual case. If we really need to clear patients more, more mental status issues, more potassium issues, we need more bicarb, et cetera, we will increase the dose to deliver more bicarb to remove more potassium. So it is customizable. We're not rock set, but we don't do the high, high dose anymore. 